Hey everyone, thanks for joining. Um, we're going to start the webinar in a few minutes time. Um, we're just going to give a few more people a bit more time to join. So if you hang fire for me. Hello and good morning to all of our attendees from the US and good afternoon for all of our attendees from the UK and thank you very much for joining our webinar exploring a people first workforce in 2023. So um, obviously um, we're just going through the process of getting everyone to join the call so just familiarize yourself with the features here on Zoom. If you've got any questions about during the presentation um, then please make use of the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. Um, there'll be plenty of time at the end of the call for us to be able to answer some of those questions for you as well, okay? So just so that you're all aware, um, this session's actually being recorded and we'll share it with you once the session has also ended. In terms of introduction, so my name's Leone, I'm the Channel Sales Manager at Indeed Flex. I work closely with the teams at Indeed Flex and also Indeed to supply the most effective recruitment solutions that will add value to our clients' organisations. Ben? Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Ben Davis. Uh, I'm an account director here at Indeed Flex. Uh, my role primarily is to knit together a lot of the work uh, that Leone does um, in a more kind of client facing uh, environment, uh, working hard to help businesses realize um, uh, plenty of um, efficiencies and driving uh, commercial um, and operational gains uh, throughout the company. Um, and yeah, look forward to spending some time with you all this afternoon. Thanks, Ben. So in terms of the agenda today, obviously, we want to have a bit of an overview of the 2023 labour market and um, understanding changing from changing culture from within and um, finding out what works best for you. And obviously, to summarise and answer any questions that we can for you all as well. So um, when we review the data, it's obviously clear that labour demands continue to decline. So if we look at the vacancies in, say, December 2022 to Feb 2023, there was just over 1.1 million of these. Um, and there's been an, a decrease of around 51,000 from the previous quarter. So the fall in the number of vacancies quite simply just reflects uncertainty across the industries. Um, and when asked why, the respondents made it quite clear that the economic pressures um, were some of the key factors in holding back on recruitment. And I'm sure we're all feeling the pinch here. Um, you know, businesses are at the moment in a position where they are struggling with hiring freezers. Um, there's huge increases in these freezers across the UK and the US. And this is actually ensuring that there's more pressure that customers utilise their existing staff rather than recruiting more. And obviously, with the unemployment rate remaining as low as 3.7% in the fourth quarter, um, the labour market really does remain extremely tight, um, with just 1.1 unemployed person per vacancy at the minute. So what this actually means is, again, and, and you know, we continue to say this, but employers have to stand out in the current market to be able to attract that talent. But more importantly, it's obviously clear that customers are now going to be heavily focused on retention. Um, and which is obviously what we need to do to be able to draw those workers back into the business rather than recruit new ones. And they're constantly asking the question, how can we increase the lifetime value of the candidates placed in our organisations? And how do we keep the workforce happy to reduce candidate attrition? So 
employees are in a pretty tough situation at the moment okay and um, they don't really have the funding to recruit or to increase the wages of their employees so 67.3 percent of the respondents from our survey actually identified that they found it more difficult to find the right talent and again the credit for this falls within the economic situation and obviously due to all the changes in the market at the moment clients are basically looking at the at different ways that they can effectively stand out and one of the key things that we've actually seen is the popularity for the four-day working week it's gathered a huge amount of momentum and employers are now exploring this as a new way to boost attraction and also retention for the candidates that they actually have on board. So if we actually look at, I suppose, the share of job offerings of the four day week, it's been on the rise consistently. And in January of this year, it basically sat at around 0.7% of UK job postings mentioned the four day working week. And if we compare that to sort of previous historical data, that's up from 0.4%, which it was in 2021. And that's more than triple the 0.2% that it was five years ago. So it's really, really showing that there are so many different things that customers are actually trying to do to be able to draw that talent in, but also to retain them. And obviously, um, these numbers obviously represent a small share of the overall postings, um, but generally the popularity of this has continued to rise. So when we look at the attraction aspect, it's quite interesting, actually, because it's clear that on the US side, um, they've taken great strides to increase the level of transparency for the job seekers in the market. Um, the share of US job postings on Indeed advertising with actual employer provided salary information has more than doubled between February 2020 to 2023, which is incredible to see. And overall, more than 40% of US job postings on Indeed now include that information, which is an increase of 137% in the last three years, which is astronomical. And then I suppose when we consider the challenges that employees are facing when you know combating the staffing market, there are quite a few that are available at the moment. And you know, a lot of them are falling around the attraction aspect or the retention aspect when it comes to the candidate pool. It's now more important than ever that businesses really begin to look at alternate and innovative ways to begin to manage um, their staffing to guarantee that fulfillment. And in our survey, we, we basically found that the majority of respondents um, plan to combat their challenges by offering more flexibility. And flexibility can be built in two ways. They can build flexibility within the schedules of their own internal employees, or they can begin to leverage agencies to support them with that contingency demand. But what it's allowing them to do is create this level of a blended workforce that allows them to have access to the benefits of consistency, but flexible workers to top up exactly what they need. And, you know, employees are listening to what workers want because they're asking the right questions and they're prepared to listen. And from our survey, we've established that over 25% um, of employers are now looking to provide flexible working hours. So if you put yourself in the shoes of that 25%, flexibility can mean multiple things. You can still get the consistency that you need, but maybe Joe can work three days in that week and Jane can work two days that week. And that's okay because it gives you that consistency, but it also gives the temporary worker the flexibility that they require, or even that internal worker that needs a part-time schedule. And on top of that, a key factor at the moment is the well-being of the workers, really looking after their mental and physical well-being, but also trying to create an environment which is worker-centric worker that really begins to have the candidate at the heart of the organisation. And I suppose to top it off, workers are obviously looking um, for roles that can basically fit around them, okay? Um, whether it be that you're a single parent and you need to work 10 till two because it covers obviously that block of day and you need to be able to do the school run. It could be that getting to work on a 6 a.m. till 2 p.m. shift just doesn't work for you quite simply because of the bus routes. Maybe we can make some adjustments and changes. So workers are basically looking for what suits them. And because there's so much choice in the market, they can basically go out and I suppose get what suits them. And I suppose if you were a worker, put yourself in their shoes and ask that question, why wouldn't you want to gain access to work? That suits you. We're not in a society anymore where they need or want to mold themselves into a role that, you know, basically doesn't fit them, that fits the employer. They want something to fit their lifestyle. And there's so, so much choice. So if employers basically need to focus on retention by looking inwards and beginning to explore exactly what the workers want, asking the right questions and looking to see how their business can adopt and support new processes and new changes to create the necessary adaptations.
Thanks, Leonie. Um, so uh, what we wanted to focus on a little bit here is just to um, put a little, uh, a bit of a highlight, I suppose, onto um, how traditional staffing models uh, currently operate um, uh, and how they have been and can continue to evolve over time uh, in order to achieve <clears throat> some of the things that were set out in, in the first part of uh, this conversation. So, um, you know, I think it would probably be fair to, to say that um, in in less uh, mature or evolving organisations, uh, you know, managers and leaders tend to hold, a, I guess, a more traditional view of employees and, you know, and everyone has a role to play within that traditional hierarchical, you know, org chart. Um, you know, each employee will have a certain box that they work within, you know, linked to a set of tasks and responsibilities and, and you know that links directly to uh, at varying levels um you know a level of, of unengagement amongst that workforce what it also can cause you know um from a perception uh, point of view is that you know uh, employees struggle within that kind of really really uh, defined and rigid environment um but i think Leon, if you can just flick to to the next slide please uh if if you look at how um successful businesses and some of the businesses we work with on a um you know on a real strategic level uh focus on um and 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 you know being in within being sorry being part of indeed is a big part of that you know really looking at a change in that workplace model how um how, you know how you associate value to employer branding and and how um that real understanding that the brand and perception of your, of, of, you know, of, of how you're perceived in the market actually is the reality in which you're judged not both by internal employees, but, you know, externally in the market. And as you only said, in a particularly tight market, those, those things are critical. Um, you know, how do workers identify um, with, with you as a business? Do, you know, do they have a sense of pride um, and, and belonging? And do they, do they genuinely buy into, um, you know what what the vision uh, mission and tactics and values are of the business uh, you know and i was actually recently asked in a in a session i was doing you know how do you you know under what circumstances do you work your best um and and um you know become uh most energized you know and and all of that led me to talk about how when i believe in what the company delivers you know for me as an individual that really really gets the best out you know out of any particular situation and i think that's really really critical um and as you know we've looked at um employee engagement experiences and you know things like health and well-being and flexibility that you know uh, they are no longer uh a nice to have they're, they're almost an expectation from from somebody who would be in the marketplace or you know looking for looking for uh how they can grow a career within a business um just flick to the next one please Lenny. And again, I think I think these couple of stats just uh, highlight that. So, you know, 50 percent of workers, um, you know, from a recent Glassdoor survey suggest they wouldn't work for a business with a bad reputation. And what that starts to um, highlight is that um, the traditional uh, draws to a job role, such as uh, financial gain purely, are no longer the primary driver as to why someone may choose to join or choose to leave a business. Um, you know, and 75% of that audience are more likely to apply at a company that actively manages its employer brand. And I think you'll see, you know, across a lot of the channels um, that uh, I imagine everybody um, here, uh, it, you know, is, is active on places like LinkedIn and, um, you know, anywhere that you uh, see a perception of your brand, where that is viewed positively, and there's a significant uptick in, uh, in the engagement with your business. Um, Next one, please, Nanny. So, you know, we wanted to look at how, you know, how can we bring that to life? How, how does that look and feel um, in real time? Um, and so, you know, the creation of an environment that uh, really is um, for learning, not, you know, not just for results driven activity, KPIs, targets, you know, goals roll down whichever way your business or you know businesses you work with deal with it but really creating an environment where people feel that not only that they can learn and socialize and, and really um attach themselves to your brand but also they feel that you've got a role to play in innovation and how the business may move forward you know i've always worked in a traditional um 
you know, probably as demonstrated on that first slide, corporate, you know, type environment. And it really is a, has been an eye opener working for, you know, a business where actually you understand that if employees engage with what you do as a business, actually the results almost become a given. Um, and, and the targeting for targeting sake in, in, in some circumstances that actually becomes quite redundant. Um, so looking at, you know, how you can create that focus on being uh, in, in un, uninterrupted, I should say, you know, in the pursuit of driving uh, the, the brand together, uh, it allows it, individuals, you know, their own time and space to, to strategize and collaborate and, and, you know, study and be part of, um, you know, delivering the ultimate goal. Um, you know, whether that be in a, like a, a classroom teaching environment or as I say, collaboration with your peers, um, you know, that learning really is around how you can take certain parts of people's knowledge that, you, you know, that they may not, may not have had an opportunity to bring to the fore um, and complement, you know, against other people within the business. Um, stick to the next one for me, please, Leonie. You know, and again, I, I think a constant theme of this is about um, pride and belonging and attaching yourself to the culture. So, you know, eliminate that outsiderness. And, and I referenced that, as, you know, when I joined uh, Indeed Flex from a, from a corporate environment, you always, you know, first of all, always would think, oh, that's not how I did it before. And uh, and actually that becomes a, that, you know, once you are create an environment where people that join your business um, can release themselves from those kind of preconceived ideas, and really helps to, to, to drive forward, um, you know, all, all of the more strategic deliverables that you're looking um, to focus on. You know, um, organisations that have a sustainable DEI um, DE initiative demonstrate, you know, a quite significant one in five, so 20% 20, 20 increase in inclusion. Um, you know, as we looked at, a few of these stats are, are, are you know, are very uh, focused around, you um, this metric so we know seven out of ten employees suggesting their organization fails to inform them um of opportunities to promote inclusion in their day-to-day -day work you know so um it's quite easy to, to to pick out where um the perception of the business in some areas can sometimes fall down and become um or, you know almost a blocker so we're looking at you know how we can advocate everybody's voice to be heard and investing in you know not necessarily that um, more traditional structure, but how you know each colleague's growth and development can incorporate you know into into the delivery of the of the wider business strategy, um, you know, and and those extend out you know as we say outside of that kind of direct uh, remuneration that we would otherwise associate with a reason why someone may or may not be successful in a job role. Um, next one, Naomi, and so knitting this together you know um from from a couple of recent surveys that we've looked at you, you see that uh you have you know whichever way you look at other 50 percent higher 57 percent higher 43 percent less turnover you know uh a significant um increase um in uh in the reduction of absenteeism um and actually you know a key thing that that hasn't been noted here deliberately you know that all of those things drive to increase, you know, increase bottom line and increase profit. But actually, without focusing on that being, the, you know, the, the sole deliverable and, and the key KPI, um, you know, the, the result almost looks after itself. Next slide, please. And so just to uh, just to kind of bring this together in summary. So, you know, employee well-being refers to, a you know, a, a lot of different parts of of, um, of the experience you know, mental, emotional, uh, you know, and physical health and well-being. So, you know, career well-being, looking at the satisfaction people will feel, you know, related directly to their work responsibilities and how they spend their time at work every day. Um, but, you know, not um, not letting that be the complete singular driver and looking at social well-being and, you know, how as part of a business and a culture you identify with, you know, engaging in healthy and meaningful relationships within the workplace, you know, is, is critically important. Um, and naturally, you know, they've got significant links to financial and physical well-being and, you know, and that general community well-being and, and uh, that, you know, the real shared, you know, shared vision, um, I think, has been critical and, and will continue to be critical in helping employees understand how, how they directly can play a role in the, uh, the success of your business. Thank you. 
Thanks, Ben. So what I would like to do is obviously just um, take you through our listen and learn portion, just sort of encapsulating everything that we've discussed today and, and seeing what key takeaways and thoughts we can all share with each other. So it's like when we consider, obviously, you know, getting the people first workforce um, that you really need for your business for us, we've bucketed, bucketed that into sort of five key places of like what you need to be looking at and what you can do to improve. Um, one of the key things is to listen to the employees um, Another benefit being the analysis of your organization, which I'll go into in a little bit more detail shortly. Are you in your company leveraging any technology that's going to boost your efficiencies and really streamline your processes to make things that little bit easier? What have you trialed? What have you tested? We all know that change is inevitable, but what can we do to do small batch tests to ensure that if we are going to create a change, we create the right change? But more importantly, how do we embrace change? And also, how do we create a culture that makes change acceptable? So in terms of obviously like that well-rounded view of your worker, OK, there are a number of things that you really need to be doing. So in terms of listening to your employees, um, you know, the one thing you really begin to need to do is understand what they prioritise and what they want to see more of. It might seem like a really obvious thing to say, listen to your staff. But too often organisations quite simply overlook one of the simplest things that they need to do, um, which is to talk to your team. Um, ask them what they want, involve them in conversations, but more importantly, involving them in these conversations doesn't just make them feel included, it also validates them. And it also helps you to be able to manage the expectations of these candidates and the workers in your organisation. And more importantly, you're going to then work collaboratively to find that resolution. And I can definitely tell you this, if you work collaboratively to find the resolution, that candidate's going to be way more invested in making it work because it wasn't dictated to them, they were consulted with. On top of that as well, you're always going to you need to be looking for ongoing feedback. Um, you can't create effective change in your business if you don't know what's happening. And the truth about that is sometimes we don't always, you know, hear what we want to hear asking questions you, you can open up a bit of a rabbit hole but in order for us to begin to improve as businesses but not just as businesses as people and individuals we need to begin to hear these truths um, and then act on those truths accordingly on top of that um, another great way for you actually to be able to gain feedback as a business is leveraging company-wide feedback surveys um, you can make them anonymous if required some people do feel a little bit more comfortable being able to identify something if they're anonymous and really begin to speak their truth it might be that you just ask them to put their name what not their name the name of their team and the location that they're based in and ask them the real question to see the level of feedback that you actually get okay um and another thing that you know for me um, that i really really value and it's something that i really value about working for indeed flex it's having and just having a transparent employer and you know having an employer that's really willing to answer the questions whether they're difficult questions whether they're easy questions or whether they're questions that directly challenge them as individuals around their leadership we're in a position where we'll be able to get those questions answered and i think for people in your organization having the opportunity just to be heard adds so much more value um, another area as well that I'd obviously recommend is looking at worker data. Um, you know, if we're reviewing, obviously, certain areas of the business, uh, business, have we identified particular trends that continue to happen all the time? Maybe as a business, you get three shift patterns in your location and the third shift always has a low worker return percentage. So how can we leverage this data to navigate things internally to make the correct changes um, to basically challenge this from happening to prevent us from losing the workers and making the changes before this actually happens. And I think the last thing that I always recommend that people do is conduct an exit interview. If someone's leaving your business, it's so important to understand why they're leaving the business, whether it's a good reason because they're moving on to pastures new or whether it's through negativity. We need to understand what that feedback is as employers. And we want to take the good things that we're doing and continue to do those good things. And anything that might be be a challenge that we need to address, we can work internally to create the necessary changes for any of these challenges as well. And, you know, talking about analysing your organisation, I suppose the key question is, 
how often do you actually analyze your organization? Um, and, you know, the figure of 71% here is actually quite shocking. And, and what this is identifying is that 71% of recruiting and hiring leaders report missing a key candidate hire basically due to inefficient hiring processes and when we talk about inefficient processes we could be talking about issues with scheduling the interview maybe we sent them the wrong zoom link maybe we got it out on the wrong date maybe it was inefficient communications in terms of the follow-up emails or not sending out the contracts or maybe it was a slow internal screening and evaluation process that meant that that candidate went to another business it's so important that we really begin to analyze these processes and take a much closer look at our organizations to a evaluate the hiring processes and you know understand is there something that we could all be doing ever so slightly different to ensure that we're not missing out on the top talent in the market and then I suppose in terms of like the business improvement layer really begin to take a strong look at your organization and highlight those key areas that you're doing well on but also where improvements can actually be made. Start it right from the beginning of the cycle, right from the start of the candidate journey, from point of application through to onboarding, and look at the entirety of the employee journey all the way through from start to finish. And when you begin to break that down and begin to evaluate what that looks like, you can start to identify the challenges and or blockers and then begin to map out how you or your team or your leadership team can begin to navigate these challenges. And also begin to understand what we can consolidate. Maybe I've got multiple spreadsheets that we don't really need to be using and I can consolidate it or automate it by leveraging technology. What can we do to create the right level of change that's gonna give time back to us, but also to the biggest business? And really begin to understand that process and look to see what friction you can remove from any of your internal processes, just to make you that little bit more efficient. And thereafter, build the roadmap for success, factoring all of the identified challenges that you understood within your evaluation earlier. So I suppose when it comes to the technology side of making data-driven decisions, in, in my opinion, data-driven decisions are vital in creating an environment you know, that workers can really thrive in. And um, the Indeed Flex data tool, um, it allows us to provide insights into things like shift performance or mapping out future shifts ahead of time, providing clients guidance around sort of expected fulfillment percentages and allowing us to create really strong partnerships and bonds with the businesses that we work with. And then flipping that over to the worker side in terms of like, what information we could be sharing with you to ensure that you attract the best talent through our platform or through other means. And we can look into things like your pay rates in the areas or your preferred shift patterns and times, allowing you as a customer and a client to make the correct critical business decisions that are going to support your day to day operation. And, you know, we're going to begin to leverage this data to consult with you and offer resolutions to some of the challenges that you've got as a business. Maybe it might be that you're struggling on fulfillment. Question could be, can we offer you short shift times to accommodate, you know, gaps in the rotor? Or it could be that you're really struggling with your fulfillment, but you put all your bookings, you ask for all your agency staff within 24 hours. How can we share forecasting data with you to ensure that you have the key pieces of information that you need to ensure that you're making the right decisions at the right time to get you the best talent? And we're going to take the time to provide you with this data and collaborate with you consistently to find the best resolutions for you, but also for the business as a whole. And on top of that, I suppose when we're speaking of data, you know, having an increased level of visibility across the entirety of your staff needs is a huge benefit to any business. It's going to allow you to keep on top of things, things that you wouldn't have ever been able to keep on top of before when everything was caught in a filing cabinet, whether it be things like agency spend or you instantly want to know how many agency hours you've billed or you want to manage your agency performance and no-shows at the click of a button, data can, and analytics can provide you with key pieces of information that keep the engine turning on a day-to-day -day basis but really begin to simplify the staffing process for you as well. Maybe the um, agency work, the agency you're working with or your own staff are saying we've got great fulfillment but actually when we look at the data only 20% of our workers return to you on a day-to-day -day basis. Well that's key pieces of information that allow not only the agency but yourself to navigate these challenges and begin to understand why do the workers not want to return and what is it that we can do about that so in terms of obviously leveraging data it's all about harnessing the information and seeing how you can apply that to your business model so that you can create the right necessary level of change for your organization and you know 
you've got to test things. You know, it's not a one size fits all model and focuses will change within the business. So don't be afraid to try different approaches to see if they actually work. You know, it might take a bit of testing for you to begin to understand what really fits, but by testing, it's the only way you're really going to know. And, you know, what we advise that you do is you track your progress. You conduct reviews to establish what's working well and what isn't working well and consistently revise the roadmap when required to ensure that any previous learnings are adopted into any future strategies. So it's about providing yourself with a structured data driven approach to measure the value of ongoing change initiatives in your organization. And I suppose as I already touched on at the start of the call, change management is difficult and, you know, it can be challenging in an organisation, but it is inevitable. And the more open you are to changing and developing your staffing model to reflect that, the more you as a business and your employees are actually going to reap the benefits of that. And 58% of employers, you know, they're going to continue using temporary staff the same or as more than they've done previously. And, you know, I think we can all understand the reason for this and, but one of the key things that's identified is that this is a really cost effective decision. Adapting in these times is vital. And without us having the ability to hire workers directly, we need to adapt to leverage those temps because that is going to be a cost effective business decision for you in order for you to hit your headcount to fulfill your orders and just generally get that job done. So I suppose just to surmise, we know that the, the labour demand is declining um, as companies pull back on funding for the new staff. Um, you know, we can identify that employers are looking towards what workers want, what workers truly want, which is extremely important to drive that retention. But they're also looking at exploring new ways um, to retain those workers, but also to attract those candidates as well. Um, you know, I've spoke about it throughout the the duration of this call but data is vital creating data-led decisions is going to be what helps you do the right thing for your business and as we all know businesses are cutting costs due to the hiring freezes so plugging your gaps with your 10 free workforce is definitely a sure way of guaranteeing operational consistency without committing um to hiring a full-time employee so um thank you very much obviously for joining us um a quick thing just to ask, obviously, um, we will check the chat now to see if there are any questions within that Q&A section and we will be able to get those answered for you. Perfect. So um, I'll take the first one or Ben, I'll pass it over to you. For you, what step what, what step one be get started when it comes to what's what would be the first step to get started when it comes to improving culture take myself off mute that'd be useful um i think from our perspective um you know we'd set be looking at how you can kind of pull yourself away from the day-to-day -day of your you know in the organization like really zoom out and take a kind of a top-down helicopter view um that that helps to a remove yourself from the the day to day of the role that you actually do, um, but also um, gives you a chance to really analyse um, each step of of what that what that feels like for someone who would work within your organisation. So from our perspective, that's looking at starting from the beginning. So that's the candidate through to you know how we engage and how we onboard on them for you know for um, what what we term it a, a flexor. So um, uh someone who who seeks temporary work through us um but equally that can that can certainly be mirrored through our uh through our own uh indeed flex employee journey all the way um you know where can those obvious improvements be made um and are there things you can you can do quickly um that will have an impact um uh, you know and outside of those there will be more strategic things that you'd, you're going to want to look at um and then map a plan um and i think the other thing to stress is this isn't um you know it's, it's not a linear process that there, there isn't always um a start and an end um it will it will evolve and you know it will continue to evolve and what might might be relevant for the business now um whether you grow or whether you move into different markets or um start to see shifts in um the makeup of um of your business um that journey will con continue to evolve not just you know with one or two um quick you know tweaks or fads um so that yeah, that's probably where I would start on that one. 
Thank you, Em. Um, another one um, was, um, can I still improve um, company culture through non-financial means? Um, and I'll definitely I'll obviously say, yeah, 100% yes to that. Um, there are multiple things that you can do outside of giving people bulk pay rises. And we touched on it previously. You know, what is it that the workforce are looking for? What can we provide them in terms of well-being initiatives that are actually going to be able to support them as well? And, you know, let's be honest, if you're caring about your employees and you're showing them that you care about their well-being, you've already improved the culture in your organisation as well. So ask questions, continue to listen to what they actually want and communicate them with them effectively. Um, and I suppose, you know, this will ensure that they know that you understand what their goals are and that they also understand the goals of the business and the steps for us all to get to the collective benefit at the end um and i suppose just last question i'll back this one over to you ben if that's okay um going back to the people-centric culture what are some things that can be done to eliminate outsiderness um that's yeah that's an interesting one because i like i am um, i fit in that demographic of people when i joined the deflex a couple of years ago and i think you know really striving for um how do you determine it? I guess really striving for a culture in, you know, in which um, your individuality is noticed um, and not just noticed, but valued. So there, you know, there are lots of ways you can do that, that they, they don't necessarily all result in promotions and monetary value, uh, you know, uh, recognition, but, um, you know, taking time for line managers to, um, you know, understand how your individuality can contribute, you know, to the immediate task or to the team or to the wider business strategy i think is really really important um you know demonstrate um and really understand um what makes people in your team tick you know how um how you structure things like um one-to-ones um and 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 are they you know do you even call them one-to-ones you know how do you kind of create that environment where you check in routinely um with employees and create an environment where they don't um you know we we, we move away from the, the more formal kpi driven uh, reviews of performance i guess um you know wider workplace support understanding um you know understanding and trust you know with within your wider kind of understanding of the business you work within and your direct managers they all reduce um the likelihood of um of an individual feeling like an outsider and, uh, and that's something certainly i experienced when i um when you when you join a business that's got a really tight culture um th those things really help to um uh carve out a good experience for someone you know that comes in from from something that, that's different perfect thanks so much for that ben and i suppose just looking at the chat that is the last of the questions so um, I suppose just to close out for myself and Ben, thank you all ever so much for joining us today. Um, it brings us to the end of the session, but most definitely the recording is going to be emailed across to you all shortly. Um, but for now, enjoy the rest of your day and we look forward to seeing you all at the next webinar. Thank you so much. Thanks, everybody.